Thank you, Brian. And welcome back. I'm really honored that you came back on the second talk. That's a real load of confidence. So thank you. <laughs> and um, I guess what Brian says is true. It's not noble that I do it. I just follow my interests. I really like studying these bees. It's a lot of fun. Um, I don't like delegating research because I feel like I have to see it with my own eyes. To, uh, not only to do the project that I have in mind, but usually uh, most every discovery I've made has been involved when I'm looking in one direction and I see something over here on the side that was unintentional. And I wouldn't have that opportunity if I was trying to work for somebody else's brain. And I try to uh, have my students do, this, do it likewise, and Brian's a great example of that. What I want to share with you today is kind of part two of the talk I presented yesterday. Which last time we looked at uh, how this swarm working as a, a brain-like collective intelligence makes a decision. Uh, but I didn't take you on to the next stage of how, you, how the bees actually then implement their decision. And this is an even more difficult question to address. Um, I'll, I'll share with you what we know about this. It's a remarkable phenomenon. And uh, we know some of it, but not all of it. What do I mean by a remarkable phenomenon? Well, imagine you're a, imagine the situation of this swarm of bees. It's been making its, its decision. Let's say it's hanging from this tree branch here on the edge of the clearing, on the edge of the forest. Once they've made their decision and they've chosen a tree that's on this hillside over here, which is about a mile away, they have to synchronously take off. This mass of bees has to synchronize their departure. They have to work their way up over to the top of the trees here and go um, make a journey together, staying together as a group, all the way across over here, and then come together, move inside this one very specific location, um, which um, it's an entrance. It'll be a knot hole in the tree. And that's not a trivial challenge. Uh, and you'll also recall from perhaps if you were yesterday's talk that only a tiny minority of the individuals in the group, there's a group of say 10,000 or so bees, maybe more, only a few hundred of them have actually been to the new location. So only a small percentage of them are informed. Almost every, almost every individual is uninformed about the destination. So there's a real challenge of, of group, um, group movement here. So I, and so I guess this just summarizes what I said. It's an amazing thing from particular tree, single knot hole across the forest. Amazing. Just summarize what I, uh, the other point I made, but it goes on a little more deeply. Yes, a swarm, one queen bee, 10,000 worker bees. The queen is uninformed as well. Three to five, as we're going to see, a key part of this story is the temperature situation of these individuals. During the decision-making process, the scalpies keep their body temperatures up. Particularly, they keep their flight muscle temperatures high. The insects um, need flight muscle about 35 degrees centigrade, about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, um, for it to contract fast enough to generate lift for flight. So the scalpies stay hot, at least the ones that are active at any given time. The vast majority of the bees are quiet and calm in the swarm. And the reason they're uh, quiet and cool in the swarm is that they're conserving the energy. When these bees left their kernel hive, each bee had her left with her honey, with her, um, honey stomach or crop stuffed with honey. And that's going to be a, a fuel supply for the swarm, but also it's an energy supply when the bees move into their new home. Most of these bees are quiet. They've let their body temperature drop to the ambient temperature, so their metabolic rate is low, so they conserve their energy. But of course, the fly, to make this flight, they're all going to have to warm up get their flight muscles up, the up to high temperature so they can make the flight. And that's another problem they face. So here are the questions we're going to address. How does the group achieve a synchronized departure? And when I say synchronized, you'll see it's, it takes, they all take off within about 60 seconds. A synchronized departure and at the right time, once the decision has been made. Secondly, the question is, how do the group's members know who the leaders are? The leaders are the informed individuals. How, do they, how can they be recognized in the group? And how do the leaders guide the followers? So these are the three questions we'll address. Let's start with that first question. How to achieve a synchronized departure at the right time? Well, this picks up, this is a slide from yesterday's talk where I explained that this decision-making process is a race between competing evidence totals. What determines when a decision has been made is when one of the sites, the number of scouts uh, at one of the sites has reached a quorum. So something at this point has to happen in order for the process to move into the next stage of implementing the decision. What is that? How do these implement their decision? Well, I mentioned that one of the things they have to do is they have to warm up their, um, all of the cool bees need to warm up. And here's a 
to illustrate that there really is this warm-up process, I used a thermovision camera to take a picture of a, the surface of a swarm 15 minutes before takeoff. Here's our temperature scale. So if the bee is hot enough to fly, her, she's gonna, her thorax is going to show up into this light gray, maybe even the white kind of temperature. So 15 minutes before takeoff, there's a hot bee here. There's a bee with a hot thorax here. There's one here. And then most of the bees are cool, you can see. But here's the same swarm. Here's the same little pointer as a reference point. One minute before takeoff, everybody's got her thorax heated up. Have the bees in the swarm cluster know when to warm up their flight muscles? Well, this warm-up is triggered by the scout bees from the winning site producing a special signal worker piping. Now, here I want to do is just make, uh, say a special few words about these scout bees. They are the most amazing bees. I mean, they exemplify the incredible versatility of behavior that insects can have. Because as we'll see in this talk, when building on yesterday's talk, these little scout bees have been explorers, they've been inspectors, they've been heavy recruiters, they've been debaters. In this talk, they're going to serve still further roles. They're going to be rabble rousers, they're going to be getting everybody going, and they're going to be guides. And so they have to do a lot of things. And in terms of now, we're going to be looking at them in terms of the rabble rousing. How do they get everybody warmed up and going? Well, one of the first things they do is this worker piping signal. This is a signal that a bee produces by vibrating the flight muscles in her thorax without actually um, activating the big, full wing movements. And these are, see, these are sounds that are, have lots of harmonics. So the fundamental frequency is only about flight muscle, about 300 hertz, but it has these harmonics. So it actually is a piping or pitch, high pitch sound. I'll play it to you in a second. Each one only lasts about a half a second or a second. And what the bee does to do this piping, when she makes a signal, one of these bees, she sends to quorum, she comes back to the swarm, she runs around on the surface of the swarm, pushing her thorax against cool bees. And by doing, giving that, that signal, that's a signal that says, time to warm up. What's this act behavior actually look like? Well, I'm going to show you a video where the best way I could get it to show it clearly was to take a video of the, of the scout bees piping what is it's called a queen cage. We had a swarm that took off. I had the queen confined in the cage. So these scout bees came back. They sensed the queen was not with them, had not taken off. And they were massively piping the cage, trying to, in, trying to excite the queen to warm up and take off. Little did they know, she, her thorax temperature was actually 40 degrees centigrade. She was very, very hot. She was ready to go. But here's what, here's what, uh, here's what it sounds like. This little thing over on the right is a microphone. Come on, Mom, go. <laughs> Signal that um, it's a useful signal to beekeepers. If you go, you see a swarm hanging in a tree, and you put, you can go up to a swarm, you put your ear next to it. If you hear that piping, that means that swarm's getting ready to go. It's going to take off within you know, 30, so maybe an hour, uh, or within the hour. But if it's really high pitched, it means it's about to take off within minutes. It had been a sound that beekeepers had heard for many, many years, um, but it was a little tricky to to find out who was doing it. Had to, had to, had to have the right microphone and be patient watch carefully. Uh, you might wonder, well, what's the evidence that this signal actually triggers warming up? Well, let me go through the evidence. One is that uh, <coughs> correlational evidence is that here's a plot of over an hour, about two hours actually, before a swarm takes off. This is the swarm you know, that was mounted here from which the data are taken. There are microphones implanted in the swarm, so we can pick up, we can pick up the uh, amount of piping that is occurring, and that's plotted here. It's the percent time that piping is heard. You can see that about an hour before takeoff, it starts to pick up, and it, it builds up till, um, till the piping sound is continuous. You can also, there are also temperature probes mounted in the core of the swarm and in the mantle, the outer layer of the swarm. And you can see that, and here's the ambient temperature, you can see that even before the piping is started, Things are warmer in the swarm than, than the ambient. But especially once the piping starts, the temperature 
you know, warms up, is particularly in the mantle. The mantle or outer layer is the last place for individuals to get warmed up. And <coughs> remarkably, you can see that within a minute or so, once everybody has their this high temperature, this liftoff, the swarm launches into flight. And that's just correlational evidence that there's this association between more and more piping and the swarm warming up. I wasn't really satisfied with that. I wanted to do a, an experimental test of this idea. I did it the following way. I, I set up my swarm, and with, when I set up these swarms, I actually put up a screen on the outer layer of the swarm. It, it's, it helps us give it, it makes a planar surface on which the bees will dance, so the video recordings are, okay, we can read the video recordings more accurately. Uh, and I made one of these screens on the outer layer of the swarm, so it actually had two little chambers in it. And the bees with the outer layer of the mantle of the swarm, would part of some of the bees would be in these two chambers. Each chamber had a little uh, thermocouple temperature reader in it. And what it, uh, this enabled me to do was, it enabled me to, in one of these chambers, I, I would have a cover or a screen that would be put on the, on the, on the um, chamber, but it was an open screen so the pipers could get into the bees in the, in the chamber. The other one had a screen that went on there and it prevented the pipers from making contact with the bees inside the chamber. And I wanted to see if these bees that were, uh, could not be contacted by the pipers would in fact not warm up. And what did we find? Well, we found that, okay, here's one of these time records. And we've got a temperature for the um, core, which is high, and it rises up uh, at this point. And it rises up to that high temperature when it takes off. What happens to the temperature in these two chambers? Well, there's the open chamber, open part of the cage, and that temperature rises up as normal, and the piping is starting right, right here when the screen, screens are installed on these chambers. That rise, rises up, so if the cage is open and the pipers can contact those bees, those bees warm up normally. But if you look at the temperature of the bees inside the closed cage, they don't warm up hardly at all. And in fact, um, after the swarm is taken off, those bees of course are trapped in the cage, they can't fly away. You take off the, you talk off, take off the, the screen covering that cage and you um, just brush the bees, they tumble to the ground. They're too cold to fly. They didn't get the message. So this is our, this is our um, best evidence that this signal is not just correlated with warming up, but is actually reducing the warming up. Okay, everybody's warmed up. They still need to. Then they still need to know. Okay, they still need to know when to take off. And if you're a bee, imagine you're a bee just sitting on the surface of the swarm. You might know that you're warmed up, but have know that everybody's warmed up, and thus when's the right time to go. Well, that comes back to our little scout bees. What are they doing? They're going all around on the surface of the swarm, grabbing bee after bee after bee. They are in a position to know when everybody is warmed up. Because when they start encountering bee after bee after bee that they feel as they grab them that they're warm and they have thermal receptors on their antennae, um, they would be in a position to do this polling of the temperature situation of bees. And in fact, to the best of our knowledge, that's what they do. What we can see is that once the, the, everybody on the mantle of the swarm is hot, then our little scalp bees start making another signal. They stop their piping and they start making what's called a buzz run. This is a behavior where the bee runs around and does a, a ritualized version of the takeoff movement. They buzz their wings, uh, spread their wings, buzz them, run around, and burrow through the other bees. And um, this tree, and if you look at what the effect of this is, it causes bees to break up and t launch into the air. Again, to, to get a good video of it, I'm doing um, recording it as an after effect after the swarm's taken off. I'm going to look at a, a buzz runner or two on the screen of the queen cage. Here's one. It, it really, it, 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 it's, it, it's not so dramatic here where there aren't that many bees, but when there's a, cl a cluster of bees, that bee is put bulldozing through the other bees, breaking them up with those. Uh, movements. I like a particular signal, but I like this signal especially because it really is, I think, a, a wonderful example of how signals evolve from intention movements. This was a, this probably evolved from the intention movement to take off. Buzz run, time to go. 
Let me now show you what a takeoff looks like, takeoff and departure. Uh, the narration is provided by a, an engineering colleague. This is the first time you get seen this phenomenon. <laughs> there we go. You can see an important piece of our scientific equipment is the field is the lawn chair <laughs> and the wheelbarrow. <laughs> okay, we'll time it. About 20 seconds in. If you saw a thermovision camera, this everybody's hot, very, very hot. Things just dissolve. Going into flight. We'll come back to this. I'm gonna stop here and we'll come back to this. This this video, you can see each V is a blob, which is actually a series of dots because they're different frames. We'll come back to that. That's very important in later analysis. Okay, now we got to the point where the swarm is airborne. How do the scalpies provide flight guidance? This, is a this was a really hard question to answer. So hard, we haven't really got it fully answered. Uh, to do this, I've worked with a number of people, um, different skills, <clears throat> different questions, different parts of the investigation. One is Madeline Beekman, University of Sydney, came to my lab as a postdoc. Kirk Fisher, long-standing colleague, uh, known Kirk since he was an undergraduate at Harvard. He's been working with bees ever since. Um, and also these two Kevins from Ohio State. These are uh, these are engineers that are very very um, gifted in um, applying sophisticated video technology analysis to the movement patterns of bees in the swarm cloud. Well, what was the first step? Step one was just to describe the flights of swarms. Uh, I don't know about you. But when I study a behavior, I like to just start by seeing what the animal does, what the behavior is. It's like it's baseline information. So the way we would describe these swarm flights is we set up a launch pad in a field near my laboratory, two miles off campus uh, at Cornell. In this open area, the, the ground was gridded off with these stakes, so we would have size references once the swarm took off, because we wanted to measure the, the, the dimensions of the swarm cloud. There was also a pole marked off in meter height um, nearby as a size reference. It's actually shown here. This is a very large field. There is one tree out in the middle of this field here. And in that one tree, we would put a bay time, a very attractive home for the bees. And we would set up our swarm. We have the bay time there. And we wanted to then have this swarm, choose that site as their home, and then we could we would have um, the track to the uh, new home marked off with units of distance, and we could measure the velocity and, and so forth. The trick was, how do you get a swarm here to go just to that box? I mean, there's all these trees, and there's lots of nest sites in the area. There's forests everywhere. How do you do that? How do you think we did that? How do we get them to focus on that one box? Think nasty. <laughs> yeah, that helps. Like, put it, make put it, what's called a swarm lure to make the box more conspicuous. Leave the trail towards the box. We didn't do that. We didn't do that. I, I, and I, but I did try something like that. I tried taking scalpies off the swarm, taking them over to the box, and introducing them. That was a complete failure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we did is we would carefully. The, what's the right word for this? We would, what's the word when you, you have your mail censored? We censored the communications on the swarm cluster. We would sit by the swarm, and if any bee, hence the lawn chairs, if any bee came back and did a dance for any site other than our nest box, she was put in the cooler. <laughs> she wasn't killed, just, just she got chilled down. She was removed. So the only bees that could advertise successfully a home site were those sooner or later that found the bait heart. So that worked pretty well. It's a lot of work to come. <laughs> so we would let we'd get the swarm focus on that home, and then we would just watch, I mean, we could watch how they took off and flew. What did we see? Well, one thing is we wanted, we just wanted, as I say, describe things. Just what were the sizes and shape of this of this aerial cloud, this swirl <coughs> cloud of swirling bees? Well, the length, regardless, and we did this for different sized swarms, and it depends a little bit on the number of bees in the swarm, but it doesn't vary too much. Typically, it's about 10 meters long, so to be about from that wall over to about here. 
uh, be about seven meters wide, not quite as wide as long, three meters high, and as I said before, the bottom of it is not too high above your head height, and it works out to about 50 bees per cubic meter. And they're not colliding with each other, at least we don't see many collisions. So they're, 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 they're in this, this size cloud. It's quite a manageable size cloud. What about the flight speed? What is the pattern of, the, of this collective cloud's movement? Well, here's the, uh, the pattern of the, how the velocity, or like technically speed, speed changed as they went, made their flight. The flight was um, to a site that was 270 meters away. You can see that it's just, it would be just like you driving a car there. You know, you'd start out at zero velocity, and then for the, at first you're gonna have to accelerate, you'll probably get up to some terminal velocity partway along, and then before you get right to your target, you wanna start to slow things down, and that's what they do. They start putting on the brakes out here, 60 or 80 or so meters before they get to the destination. And remarkably, it doesn't always happen this way, but most of the time it works this way, that cloud comes in, it puts on the brakes, slows down, and stops right in front of the new home. It's just, it's just breathtaking to see this happen. And then the swarm goes into their, in, then the bees start coming out of the cloud, scalpies go to the entrance of the nest box, and um, start producing a chemical signal that, that gives the final guidance of the precise entrance opening. Now one thing that's, we don't know how this, we don't fully know, we have some ideas about how this acceleration works, and I'll talk about those. We don't know how the braking works, except that I can say it's not that they're losing the scalp bees. The scalp bees don't settle out of the cloud <coughs> until the thing has come to a stop. So I, I think those scalp bees are doing something to slow it down, but I don't know what it is. I have some ideas, but I'm not sure. You can see it's a remarkable, remarkably well-organized control process. <clears throat> so now we want to focus on this question, how does this informed minority guide the ignorant majority? Good question, huh? <laughs> a, a good general question. <laughs> <laughs> hypothesis, there's a, I, we have two working hypotheses. One was olfactory guidance, and when I mean olfactory guidance, we know that when the scout bees, the, the bees have a gland, glandular tissue, beneath the uh, last two segments of the abdomen, the, this glands secrete onto a membrane there, and that membrane, they can expose that membrane and release the pheromone by raising the abdomen, ex um, exposing those two tergites, and uh, fanning the wings to disperse the, the pheromone that's coming off. And that is an assembly pheromone. It's, it's, known, it's long been known that that is used for attracting bees to the entrance of a hive when the swarm moves in or, or other things like that. Um, it had been proposed that the scout bees provide an olfactory guidance during the flight. I, w I didn't think this was likely, but we needed to test it. The idea was that they might make some sort of radiant um, towards the front of the swarm and that would attract other bees and they could provide the guidance that way. You can sort of see there's some problems like this. For example, swarms fly perfectly well towards their new home, even if they have a strong crosswind, which would be blowing the pheromone to the side. So it didn't seem likely, but we needed to test it. How did we do that? And this is where Madeline Abitman came in. What we did is we sealed the scent organs of the of all of the bees in swarms, we sealed them shut with paint. We make these little swarms of 4,000 bees. And this shows the structures of this gland. It's, it's here, secretes onto this membrane here. Normally that membrane is not exposed, the pheromone is not released, but if the bee lifts her abdomen it will, and separates these two turguts, uh, that membrane is exposed, the pheromone is released. But So you can prevent going from this to this by putting paint sealing this off so they can't separate those two, two segments. Our goal was to see, so we created three swarms where the, every worker had her glands sealed and three control swarms where everything was done the same. They were produced, handled in the same way, except instead of putting the paint here, we put the paint on the thorax. And we'd see if the treatment swarms can still, even though they can't use the gland now, can still perform well-oriented, normal speed flights to the new home. So we're again flying them down this 
onto this beta, this flight trajectory. Here's what we found. So we've got our three treatment swarms, three control swarms. The flight times, from time from takeoff to when the bees have gone into the hive, it's, um, for the treatment swarms, it's 330 seconds. For the control swarms, it's it's slightly less, but not significantly so. So actually, our evidence is that the flight time was not affected at all by having the gland sealed off, which is evidence against the idea that this gland is necessary to provide good guidance to the new home. What we did find, however, is that if you looked at how long it took the bees to get inside the hive once they got there, uh, the normal um, control swarms only took about eight minutes for the bees, once the swarm had settled and stopped its movement till the time when everybody was inside, that was only about eight minutes. These bees, it was about 21 minutes. So there was an effect of sealing off the glands of the bees um, at this stage of the actual final entry. And one thing we could, and this shows what it looks like at the front of the nest box with all these bees with their abdomens, the tips of the abdomens painted off, sealed. We've got a lot of bees here. They've got their abdomen up in the normal position. They're fanning their wings, but there's not a pheromone release. We did, and we could check that they were still sealed because we could sample several hundred of these bees, uh, chill them down, and carefully check each bee. We found that 1% of the bees had cracked their seals. So there was a little bit of leakage here, but evidently and not enough to, uh, certainly not so much. You could still see the effect on entry time, but no effect on flight time. So we don't think the pheromone plays a large role in the guidance. It plays a big role in the final pinpointing and signaling. Conclusion, scouts don't see the guide flight with pheromones. Scouts do guide the entry with pheromones. The other hypothesis we were working with is the visual guides hypothesis. Um, and this is a hypothesis that goes back to the work of, a, of Martin Lindau in the 50s. When he was watching, when he was running under his swarms to their new homes in Munich there, he'd look up and he saw that at the top of the swarm cloud, it looked like there would be shooting, streaking through the top of the swarm cloud, pointing the way to the new home. Um, and uh, we've seen that too. And some, it's, can be, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's it's pretty, it's a pretty strong phenomenon. But to really document it, we first wanted, we first did a photo check for streaker bees, side view, as you'll see, and then we did a follow that up late in later years with a video check for streaker bees, which will be, it turned out a bottom up view, and this has turned out to be very revealing. But let's start, first start with a photo check, it's still photos. Uh, photographic analysis, so we have our swarm flying on the, on the flight route. This is a bird's eye view, have a camera, Get the shutter speed right, and get us as the swarm would fly by. This would give us a cross-sectional view of the of the swarm as it went by. And what you see is this is what this. I hope you can see this. You do see these. Most of the bees towards the bottom are full of short streaks. The bees at the top are the, these longer streaks. These are the high-speed bees zooming by, <coughs> zooming past. So. Um, Yes, there are these high-speed bees primarily in the top of the swarm cloud, but are they guiding it? All this tells you is that these bees are streaking. We don't know which way they're streaking. They might be streaking. This swarm was going this way, but this, of course, a still photo doesn't tell you whether they're going this way or that way. They are mostly horizontal, so they're going, but we don't know if they're really pointing towards the, towards the new home or not. That's why we had to follow up with the video to looking up in the swarm, not from the side. <coughs> So the video analysis was, the question was, are the high-speed bees moving mainly in the direction of the new home? Are the high-speed bees moving mainly towards the new home? That has to be, the answer has to be yes for the streaker bee hypothesis to be correct. So what we did here is, um, here again we have a schematic, we have, a, we have our swarm takeoff, we have the, um, because we can control the flight route of the swarm, we can have the swarm fly over the camera. Camera's at one meter height, bottom of the swarm's about at two meters height. Um, the top of the swarm is about at five meters height. Now, I go through those numbers carefully because it turns out that <coughs> that, that turns out to be very convenient. It's, that's a big, 
there is a large proportional difference between a bee that's at the bottom of the swarm and the top of the swarm. And what does that mean? It means that this, all of the bees are the same size, virtually the same size. That means the size of the blob of the bee in the photographic image is an indicator of the bee's height in the swarm cloud. That's very handy. And then, so we're going to watch this. We're going to watch a swarm as it flies over the camera. I can't remember if I put these, the analysis in. We're going to actually, for each of these swarm flights, we recorded it at two places. Uh, 15 meters away, when the swarm had moved 15 meters, and then again when it had moved 60 meters away. What did we see? Well, here's a, a sample of a screenshot of these looking up into a swarm cloud. Now, the way this, you know, the shape of the video images are, is a long horizontal rectangle. This is the direction of the swarm flight. So the swarm, the whole cloud was moving in this direction. And you can see these are the tracks of individual bees. They're kind of going every which way um, in this particular shot. Now, most of these are not. <laughs> Given the direction that these bees are going, these are not the streaker bees, and they're also not moving very fast. And, but the nice thing is, for each bee, you can get a, an indication of where she is. This is a bee uh, near the top of the swarm. This is a bee near the bottom of the swarm. This bee is actually going down in her flight. Um, you can get a direction of the movement in relation to this, its angle in relation to the this direction to the home. And because the spacing of the um, from the spacing of the dots, you can get a sense of the bee's speed. So we could connect the blobs and measure each bee's flight trajectory. We first did this by hand. I should say that that's sort of a we is a little bit too generous. Kevin Schultz, um, the PhD student at Ohio State, first did a did a truthing of this method by doing one swarm by hand, and then using this nice technology that comes out of the Pixar Studio. Um, it, it can be, this process can be automated. So for each bee, we know the height of the bee, its flight speed, and its flight direction. I think I have, yeah, I wanted to go back to this. I wanted to see, see what these blobs look like again. Here they go. I think it's good to see movies twice. See, Ken had quite a job, and that's why he worked hard to get it automated. But I think you can see you can really get a lot of information about each bee. swarm cloud flying over. The camera at each moment is actually recording just a slice, a slice of that cloud of bees as it slides by. So, um, so the, and the plots that I'm going to show you are summing up. Um, they're going to be for the, uh, the, I think the plots that I'm going to be showing you are from the middle of this, this, this slice of the middle of the swarm. And what we showing here is we're going to be looking at the bee flight angle. Zero degrees means the bee was flying towards the new home site. 180 degrees would mean that the bee is flying away from the new home site, 90 degrees to the left or 90 degrees to the right. And I'm showing you two, and this shows the bee's flight speed. It's a little tricky. So flight angle, and for each flight angle, we would show the distribution of the flight speeds of the bees. I'm showing you two distributions, one for the bees at the bottom of the swarm cloud, and another distribution for the bees at the top of the swarm cloud. So what do these plots show us? They show us if we compare the top and the bottom, you can see, first of all, that these are flying faster than the top of the swarm. That's really clear, I think. The other thing that's quite clear is that 
the bees that are flying in the direction of the new home site, the zero degrees, they're flying fastest. In fact, these are the fast bees are, are indeed going towards the new home site. So this is consistent with this idea that the bees that know the right direction are the ones that are flying the fastest. Now there are more bees flying in the right direction at high speed than there are scout bees. Now how, what's going on there? Well, looking at this video, you can also track individual bees. <laughs> if you sit, and if you see a remarkable phenomenon, you'll see the bee that is flying not at the right angle, not flying at zero degrees, and not flying rapidly, but then a high speed bee flies past her. What does that slow flying bee do? She speeds up and she aligns with a fast flying bee. So bees latch on, slow disoriented bees latch on to the speedy bees by chasing after them. And this is how, you re how they recruit. The information gets passed on from the informed bees to the ignorant bees. And it's also how the swarm picks up speed because eventually, I think, initially when the thing first takes off, a lot of bees are flying slowly in a disoriented manner. As more and more bees get the information, they start flying at a faster speed in the right direction. Now one thing we don't know is what happens to these speedy bees when they get to the front of the swarm cloud. They're flying 10 meters per second. It only takes them a few seconds to fly through that swarm cloud. They must, and we do see evidence of this in the slices of the swarm cloud at the front, they do turn. You lose some of that nice directionality of the high speed bees at the front. They're turning. We don't know quite where the, and we don't know, we haven't followed their paths. We don't have the individuals marked. They're working their, evidently though, they're working their way back to the swarm and then shooting through again. They, given that you see these continuously be shooting through, there must be some way of them getting back. Um, and I would, I do want to stress that when they do that, they're probably dropping down, maybe even flying below the swarm. Because think about why they're flying at the top of the swarm. They're up there because they're very conspicuous against the clear sky. If they're down at the bottom, they couldn't streak through the bottom and be conspicuous because there the background is, is the vegetation. So they're flying at the top, high speed against the sky. So I think that's how the swarm picks up the speed. So this is strong evidence that the visual guidance or streaker bee hypothesis is correct. Is it definitive evidence? I have to say no. Better evidence would be one where if we had an experiment where we could slow down the informed bees um, and prevent them from streaking and seeing if the flight guidance was messed up. That would be analogous to sealing off the um, Denazimov glands. We haven't had success in that. We've tried trimming the wings of the scout bees to see if we could slow them down. You can slow them down, but unfortunately they stop scouting if you do that. They don't like that treatment. Um, we haven't, there are other ways we could try which we haven't tried. You could put an airfoil on the bee, you could put a little thread on the bee to slow her down. I suspect we'd have the same problems. Um, so we don't have that, we don't have that kind of experiment done. But Madalena Beekman, after she left um, my lab, came up with this, a nice idea. She came up with another way to, in, to test the streaker bee hypothesis experimentally. She did the following experiment. She set up a sw had swarms fly down a, a known flight line. So she'd have her swarm mount. She had a nest box over here, several hundred, I guess it was a 250 meters away. And she set this up next to a field of, of alfalfa that was coming into bloom. And she set up a battery of hives up to the side of the flight line of this swarm of the swarms. So there'd be a lot of forager traffic right in the uh, along criss crossing the flight line of the swarm and you can see what she was trying to do she was saying well it's this if this we have this kind of forager traffic orthogonal to the flight swarm the swarm's flight will this disrupt the flight of the swarm and indeed it does she found very striking results the swarms would take off they'd be fine here they get to this region and they would just they would get really off track so much off track not all of her swarms. She did this with, I think, six swarms. I think only half of them ever made it to the nest box. Mm -hmm. Two of them disappeared, never, never, just <laughs> were gone completely. <laughs> and one got there after a more prolonged, uh, prolonged flight. So that's, we do think this is um, pretty, is again, supportive, not definitive, but strongly supportive evidence. What's the airspeed of foragers? Uh, foragers are not quite as fast as the streakers. They would be 
Um, going out, unloaded, they're pretty, they are about eight meters per second. Um, uh, yeah. Well, how did they, they rationalize it? it? Was the streakers that were getting screwed up with the cross traffic and not just everybody in the swarm? I, I guess it's because, it is true that this, um, I think it's because, the, that's to your question, I think it's because if you're a forager going out to that field, you're flying much faster than just a swirling bee in a swarm. Mm -hmm. Next time you see a swarm flying in the air, you will look up. Most of those bees are really, they do, particularly right after takeoff, they really look clueless. They're just, they're going like this and this. It's not fast, it's loopy flights. And, and you've seen forgers headed out to a field. They just, you know, they circle up and then whoosh, they're off. But it's a good, it's a good point. So let's just review the flight prep. So what we've looked at are the flight preparation mechanisms. Scouts at the winning site, starts with them sensing a quorum and then returning to the swarm. Then adding these rabble rousers, first by making the piping signals in the buzz rooms. The piping signals we've seen, the message there is warm up your flight muscles. The buzz runs, the message is time to go. So that gets the bees up into the air. And then the actual flight guidance mechanisms, once everybody's in flight, we've seen that a small minority of the bees are guiding the flying swarm, because we know that because only a small minority know the estimation. We've seen that there's pretty skilled steering, acceleration, and braking. We've seen that the informed bees, well, what looks like the informed bees, streak through the swarm top, and the ignorant bees seem to be below, chasing after the streakers. And we've seen that this Nazanoff gland pheromone is used at the end of the journey, but not during the journey. Now I want to generalize these results. I mean, this is a phenomenal example of a coordinated movement of a group of animals. These are not unique in doing this. Of course, you know, many migratory birds have these same sorts of issues. Um, elephants have these issues. Uh, Tim's various uh, ungulates have these same sort of issues of when do, we, when do we start our move, which direction do we go. Most of these, uh, many of these other groups, however, do have, don't have leaders. They may, the, dis the distribution of uh, control may be spread among individuals. But there are other groups where individuals do have leaders. And the way that bees do it isn't the only way to solve the problem. There is a, 2005, there's this very nice paper published by uh, Ian Cousin and, and uh, co-authors on effective leadership and decision making in animal groups on a move. And this is their abstract it's from nature. This was a key parts of what their question. They said, using a simple model, we show how information can be transferred within groups, both without signaling. So the bees are using signals. And this streaking is a kind of signal. But they show you can do it without signaling, and when the group members do not even know which individuals, if any, have the information. And what they found is that if you build a model and you have every individual follow the following rules. The rule one is, <coughs> Avoid colliding with other individuals. So avoid other individuals, don't get too close. Second rule is um, uh, if you get away from other individuals, if you get too far away, then go move towards them. Third rule is tend to align your flight with uh, the movement of the sum. Uh, take an average of the flight uh, uh, directions of the individuals around you and align yourself with the average of that. And the third rule, or the fourth rule that they had was if you're informed, you know where you want to go. As you're deciding which direction you're going, factor in not only what the individuals around you are doing, but factor in, to some degree, your preferred direction. So the informed individuals, their, the direction they go depends upon not only what's going on around them, but what they themselves want to do. The uninformed individuals don't have a preferred direction, so they're just factoring in what individuals are doing around them. And you run this model, and it's nicely summarized by a nice equation. And, uh, this G represents the weight of the preferred direction, the vector of the preferred direction. Um, if you do this, the simulations work beautifully. I mean, these, what happens is the informed individuals, they, they move off in their direction. They kind of get at the front, the front of the group. And everybody else, because they, everybody's going to attract it. If you don't, you don't want to get left, they don't, following those rules, they don't get left behind. They're kind of dragged along by the informed individuals at the front of the group. So this shows us nicely that this, you could, the bees could do it in, the way, in a very simple manner like this, and probably in uh, many fish schools and in um, some flocks of birds and other things like that. That may well be how it works. But as we've seen with the bees, um, that's not how it works. They use these 
fancy things of skilled steering through the streaking uh, and so forth. But the bees are implementing those. Let's see, how do I want to say this? The bees are doing what is in this model, but they're doing beyond what's in this model. They are signaling, and they're they're indicating not only the right direction to go, but they're by making <coughs> in the street and they're indicating who does and who doesn't want the information. So I find it in I find sort of thinking generally what are the take-home lessons from this study? I think it's a good example of how it's nice to start with a model and think it might be what the simplest ways you could do it, but then it's also even more fun to go out and see what how it actually is it done. Is there as natural selection favored even more sophisticated methods probably to increase the, the performance of the system. If you're interested in this particular topic, I can refer you to chapters seven and eight of Honeybee Democracy. Thank you very much, both. I think we have time for questions. I also want to mention that there's a grad student lunch at 2320 Store Hall that's open to the animal behavior group and the other um, grad students as well. Yes. Yeah, we don't have any evidence of that. Yeah. No, it, it looks like it, and given the speed with which things are happening, it looks like the visual is the most conspicuous. But there's, and there's a lot of background noise with all the things flying around. So I suspect not. Do you think the, the restrictors actually adjust their behavior to compensate for the followers and stuff like that? How do you keep that process? Or do you think we're running into tendency and it's just up to you they have to keep up? I, yeah, the question is, is there a uh, restrictors, the informed individuals adjusting their signal um, according to the followers? And which would, you know, that would even tune the system up further. Right. I, I don't know. We haven't, I think, you know, we'll have to do the check the video analysis on that. I don't think. That would be a tricky level of our work to do. I, we, I haven't looked for that. Um, uh, my guess would be no, but I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, Rick. So one thing that I wonder about as an evolutionary biologist is where in any of the non-social, closely related taxonomy, what components of these um, collective behaviors do you see could help explain how it all came together. Yeah, well, you, um, Brian, let's see, let's start just with some of the signals, the origins of the signals. Um, I, I mentioned how I think that buzz run evolved from this intention movement, the actual movement of taking flight, and that would make sense. That's, well, that's a good, that uh, buzzing the wings and running around is a good indicator that he wants to take flight so they can see how that would naturally be a good starting point for the evolution of that signal. Brian is going to be looking at the evolution of these or where how do you, where did this Nazanoff gland come from? I, I don't know enough about the, the non-social ancestors. It's found, throughout it's found throughout the Hymenoptera. Okay, so it takes us one step to answer that part. Um, in terms of these other signals, like the streaking, I think that you can sort of see that would be a pretty easy step on from just flying normally. If you had a mutation that, like, had you, you were informed, you could just follow a rule, fly a little, fly faster. Um, uh, in terms of the um, running around and sensing temperatures and things like that, that might be. That might be built out of the, the brood. Um, these bees are using the, the using apparatus they use in the nest for thermoregulating the, the brood nest inside the hive, so they have their thermoreceptors already in place. Uh, uh, and with other, and that's not just uh, uh, I, I bet it's not just social bees that have those thermoreceptors for temperature judging. Um, I guess you have. The, I don't have a one cl good clear answer. Sort of, I guess you have to take it piece by piece and see what um, what might be the antecedents of what they have, and we'll have, and less with this Nazanoff going, and what do we see in the sister taxa as, as stepping stones to it? I'm a mushy one, so I'm afraid. <laughs> yes, Tim. Um, these scouts seem to be sort of super 
huge, superb beings. <laughs> um, uh, can anybody be a scout? Or who chooses who can be a scout? Because they're very similar to our politicians. And I know that uh, uh, I'm sure you have some things to say about that. <laughs> I think they're self-selected. Um, we're just beginning to look at what the physiological under differences or characteristics are that distinguish a scalpie from a non-scalpie. We've looked at some of the patterns of gene activity in the brain which are controlling the behavior. Um, but that really, and, you know, logically, that only moves it one step back. What's causing them to have be more active in their reward system, more prone to novelty seeking? As if um, the only piece of solid evidence we have at this point is um, uh, age. These are the older, oldest beings. But certainly not every elderly being becomes, becomes that. There may well be, there's a lot of genetic variation among individuals, and some people, in some ways, may be predisposed to this job. But they are, to me, that, that may be the deepest message of this whole story is what kind of complexity can you have? find it in something like a little b. I mean, it's just, it's, it's remarkable. To, to me, it's just remarkable that okay? these skeletons can do all these different things. And these are things they have no practice in. I mean, no, no, most work of these never are a skeleton in their whole life. Swarming only happens once, typically a year, and it only unfolds over one day, and then a couple of days. And these bees do it right from the get-go, no practice. Remarkable program. Yes? Did you, did you say that the streaker, leader bees that kind of more or less take them right toward where they're supposed to be going are not the scouts? No, they, they are, are the scouts. scouts. As far as we're the scouts. The, as far as we know, they are the scouts. But oh. I, haven't, I haven't done the really definitive test of removing the bees that we've known been to a home site and seen if there are okay, still streakers, if they're still guidance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the problem is if you take them out, you, the thing won't take off. Oh, so you have, you have to you have to get in there and really you have to warm, you probably have to warm it up. You have to play back all the the piping and the buzz runs. Or you could use an infrared lamp and heat it up and then stimulate the buzz simulate the buzz runs. That would be fun. <laughs> I have another way to do it too. Uh, you could actually remove at the last minute the, the informed bees. You put a metal tag, a ferrous tag. Is there a berry here? <laughs> a ferris tag on the back of each of the informed bees, and right as the thing is taking off, it will have an electric electromagnet. <laughs> 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 I, I want to do that. It's very good. It's very good. <laughs> At what point does the whole process start? So, do the, do the scouts start searching for the new site when they get when the swarm leaves the, the old nest, or does it start when they're still in the in the old nest? We've seen it start up to three days before. And it's look, they're starting to get options on the table. We haven't seen them make a decision until they've left the home. But it does. They don't. Break, they don't wait to the last. Minute. They they yeah, they take advantage of time and get there to get some information. And that means that the swarm never really just leaves the old hive and immediately goes right to where it's going to live next. Sometimes we've seen it only take an hour or so, but they do make that intermediate stop apparently to get the fission worked out right. They have to correctly proportion how many are leaving and how many are staying. And that, so they, they do always make that intermediate There's always stop. a cluster step then. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So did I remember reading that, uh, that there's a mixed age, age distribution in a swarm? Uh, I mean, so it, it sort of makes sense that the streakers and the, and the, uh, the scouts are much older and experienced than, than a lot of the bees in the swarm. A lot of bees don't have much experience at all flying, and so they would be the ones down there, you know, kind of just poking along, and they'd be susceptible to, to getting led by the, by the, by the scouts. I don't know, does that make sense? Uh, it does, it does, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. There's a lot, when the swarm leaves, a lot of bees have left the hive that have not done their orientation flights and things like that. A lot of the bees that are left behind in the parental hive are bees that can't get fly. Yes. Um, when the scouts are at the running site, um, what is that going to happen in the and what kind of signaling do they use? To we don't know. That's a great question. It's one of the unknowns. How does the bees sense that enough bees have built up at four and reach? You see the bees bumping into these things, so they might be contact rage and counter rage. They might be, they might be doing what we do. We can actually just look at the thing and you can see the crowd is built up visually outside of the front. We don't know.